Siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll Be There, the first single from the Jackson 5's third album, literally titled Third Album, was released on the day before Michael Jackson's 12th birthday in August of 1970. It went to number one on both the Billboard Heart, Hot 100 and Soul Singles charts and hit number four in the UK. The song was co-written by several established songwriters and record producers, including Motown owner Barry Gordy Jr. and producer Hal Davis. Because the Funk Brothers, oh, they're the session musicians who regularly worked for Motown, hadn't yet relocated to Los Angeles from Detroit. The track was recorded with LA-based studio musicians, including keyboardist Joe Sample of the Jazz Crusaders. Michael Jackson shared lead vocals with his older brother, Jermaine. The song was the Jackson 5's biggest hit, and it was also a critical success. Following the group's earlier hits, I Want You Back, ABC, and The Love You Save, I'll Be There, well, it solidified the Jackson 5's careers, and it showed audiences that the group had potential beyond bubblegum pop. A reviewer in Stereo Gum put it this way, I'll Be There is an almost painfully adult song, a song about regret and longing and warmth and support and mixed up feelings. And Jackson sings it with an almost absurd grace a sense of empathy and tenderness and understanding. He was doing this at an age, writes this reviewer, when, when I was eating entire cans of frosting that I'd stolen from my parents' pantry. According to a review in All Music, commenting on Michael's vocals, rarely, if any, had one so young sung with so much authority and grace, investing this achingly tender ballad with wisdom and understanding far beyond his years. Record World said that the change of pace, using a slower tempo than their earlier hits, showcases the group's versatility. A duet version of the song by Mariah Carey and Trey Lorenz was released in 1992, and that became her sixth straight number one hit. The song was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2011. The song, I'll Be There, is a pledge to support and comfort another person, no matter what happens. In the third verse, we realize that the song is about the singer's ex, and the singer is promising that he'll drop everything and come running whenever his former love gets lonely. That line transforms it from a song of friendship into a song of heartbreak. But the first two verses and the chorus remind me of what Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel and what the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit. Listen to these lines from the song. Where there is love, I'll be there. Just call my name, I'll be there. I'll be there to comfort you. I'll be there with a love that's strong. I'll be your strength. Let me fill your heart with joy and laughter. Whenever you need me, I'll be there. I'll be there to protect you. Just call my name and I'll be there. And I could have gone on. That's just some of those lines with that kind of feeling. Now, as we were going through songs and identifying which ones we'd use for our gospel rock series this year, I couldn't help but think of the last line of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus says to his disciples, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The context, as Matthew tells the story, is, is that the disciples have gone to Galilee, where the risen Jesus had instructed Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to tell the disciples to go meet him. And the disciples went, probably not knowing whether the women's words were true, setting out on an unknown journey into an unknown future with only a word. Well, this characterizes 
what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Jesus does meet the disciples in Galilee, as he has promised, but the response is mixed. Some worship him, but some doubt. Now, you might have expected that upon encountering the risen Lord Jesus, the response would have been clearer. But as New Testament scholar Craig Kaster points out, a mixture of faith and doubt also characterizes discipleship. Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who trained to be a Lutheran pastor, then spent his career writing, calls attention, calls attention to the need for a leap of faith. Because we can never be 100% certain. We can't prove it. So faith is required, even as doubt is sometimes the flip side of faith. And we understand this from our own experience. We are called to go. We're called to go to where Jesus will meet us. We're directed to places and experiences where we will have the opportunity to meet the living, risen Christ. We hope to encounter the presence of God, the presence of Jesus in worship, prayer, or in service to others, for example. Yet, we might wonder if it's true. Maybe it's the hope. Maybe it's the hope that the message is true and that participating in a community of believers where Jesus promises to meet people, promises to be present for us. Maybe it's that we hope we might meet him and he'll meet us as well. Then Jesus sends this group of disciples who don't have it all together out to make other disciples. Now this might not seem like a great plan, but God uses imperfect people. Why does God use imperfect people? Because that's the only kind of people there are, right? And these imperfect disciples whom Jesus instructs to go are in no position to make themselves the object of faith. That is part of the good news. The invitation is not to follow some particular pastor, some particular politician, or some would-be prophet. No, the invitation is to follow Jesus. And following Jesus means learning to obey his commands, to follow his teachings. Now, we will do this imperfectly, but we are called to strive to live in accordance with Jesus' commands, his teachings, which are completely countercultural in today's secular, materialistic, consumer driven culture. No one can make anyone follow Jesus. What the disciples have and what we have is the word from the living, risen Jesus Christ that invites us to follow. And Jesus promises to be with us always. How does this work? The good news, according to Matthew, gives us several examples, for, including, as we see in Matthew 1, verse 23, Jesus will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God's presence, and he is the best revelation that we have of what God is like. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, Jesus sends his disciples out saying that whoever receives or welcomes his disciples also receives or welcomes him. Jesus is present with us through the presence of other believers. Those of us who are following Jesus are collectively the body of Christ on this earth, and we encounter Jesus through relationships with each other. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus tells his disciples that where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The church here is assured of the continued presence of Jesus as we carry out his mission to work for the kingdom of God and to teach people to follow Jesus' commands, which are really good advice about what living in the kingdom of God on this earth looks like. We encounter Jesus when we worship, when we study the Bible, or serve together, for example. Martin Luther defined the church as people who gather together for worship 
And one of the ways we encounter the presence of God, the presence of Jesus in this world, is by attending worship. And Jesus is present with us through the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20, beginning at verse 21, as Jesus is meeting his disciples on the evening of the first Easter Sunday, Jesus said, and here I'm using N.T. Wright's suggested translation, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you tell anyone of the forgiveness of sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not tell them, they are not forgiven. We are sent on a mission. Just as God the Father sent Jesus on a mission to teach us what living in the kingdom of God looks like, and then die and rise, defeating the power of evil, we are called to be on a mission from God. To love the world like God loves the world, including loving the people in the world who are opposed to God and God's values. And we're called to tell people of the offer of forgiveness and how Jesus sets us free from the power of of sin, including our own failures. How Jesus sets us free from that power as well as the power of death and the power of evil in this world. And the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ, the primary way we encounter the presence of Jesus in this world, accompanies us on this mission. In addition to referring to the Spirit of Christ, Paul sometimes calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of the Son. Jesus is indeed the giver of the Holy Spirit, who is Jesus' continued presence in the world. In Acts 2, verse 33, in Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost, we read that Jesus, in fact, has poured out the Holy Spirit. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, Peter says, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. We Lutheran Christians claim to believe in the Trinity, that God consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons, or faces, perhaps. The easiest way to understand the Trinity is to simply say that there are three different ways in which God relates to the world. And this isn't the whole story, but it's a good start at understanding the Trinity. We might say, for example, that God the Father is the creator and the provider, that God the Son, Jesus, is the one who redeems us, and the Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies us or makes us holy. In practice, however, like many Western Christians, we tend to put much more emphasis on the Father and the Son than on the Holy Spirit. Um, the typical college or seminary level theology textbook is about this thick, and the first almost half of it is about God the Father. The second almost half of it is about God the Son, and there are a few pages at the end as if apparently when, when they were almost done, they said, oh, we can't write a book this big, just a few pages at the end about the Holy Spirit. So it's worth spending at least a, bit of, a little bit of time today talking about who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does for us. When we say the creed, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, that's Catholic with a small c, church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What do we mean by that? Well, for starters, the Holy Spirit makes us holy. Other kinds of spirits are referenced in the Bible, such as the human spirit, heavenly spirits, and even evil spirits. But only God's spirit is called the Holy Spirit. How does this process of making us holy, sometimes referred to as being sanctified, take place? You might think the creed doesn't actually tell us much about the spirit, and then goes on to mention these other things. But the other things, the communion of saints, the church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection and everlasting life are a list, admittedly a partial list or description, of ways in which the Spirit works to make us holy. We are led into a holy community, into the church, 
where we hear the word of God and are brought to faith in Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we worship, when we gather together, we hear the word of God read and proclaimed, we pray, we sing songs of praise and worship, we sing hymns, we receive the presence of Jesus through receiving the Lord's Supper, also known as communion. And when we do all those things, the Holy Spirit is at work in us to bring us to faith or to strengthen our faith. As Martin Luther pointed out in his large catechism, where Christ is not preached, there is no Holy Spirit to create, call, and gather the Christian church, apart from which no one can come to our Lord Christ. We are brought into the true church by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is always with us as the presence of Christ. We learn of and experience forgiveness because of the work of the Spirit as we hear and have the opportunity to respond to the good news. And because we are never completely without sin, we, were all, we are always in need of this forgiveness. Through the, Holy, through the Holy Spirit, we are made holy. We are made right with God. And our holiness is increased when we spend time in spiritual practices that bring us into contact with Jesus and his Spirit. By teaching us the good news of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is at work to bring us to faith, then to continue the lifelong process of increasing this holiness in us, being the presence of Christ in us so that we may become little Christs to our neighbors, sharing with them the love of God so that they may also experience the presence of Jesus Christ, who is always, who is always with us. Thanks be to God.